Hey, Steve. Hey, Mike. How you doing, buddy? Como esta, amigo? Not much. I'm just getting all set up here. How's things going with you? Great. So I've, I've decided to make a little life rule about you. About me? Yep. Okay. Don't ask Steve to host any videos between the months of June and November. <laughs> the hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. So I think the last time we, yeah, actually, last time I was on, we've had two hurricanes since then, I believe, right? People are starting to think I buried you under the house. Yeah, no. Uh, we, luckily, we fared well for both of them. The first one that actually hit the west coast of Florida was much worse for us as far as, uh, you know, just natural disaster wise than the one that hit us directly two or three weeks after that. So uh, we barely got any rain or anything. The eye went right over us and that was pretty much it. A lot of flooding in the local area, but everything else is unharmed. So that's good. Good. Glad to hear you came out in one piece, man. Yeah, that may be a smart play to uh, to do that, though. To not, <laughs> we have to, might have to coordinate our schedules a little better during those summer months. We had a couple of AD questions that uh, I tried to put and get around. I can't guarantee I was super successful, but... Uh, oh, no worries. I'm just waiting for the chat to pop up right now. How's everything else going with you? How was your holidays? Thanksgiving and everything? Oh, it's always good. Nothing good. exciting. Ooh, Zam made it today. Um, Sam was the guy who asked three weeks ago how to push MSI outs on a uh, script. So I wanted to go ahead and do your thing first before I answered that question. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. So do we want to catch up or we want to get right into kind of the modality of it all or? Well, what I want to do right now is just stall a little bit. Uh, these folks are notorious about not showing up on time. So well, I've I've started videos where we have like six people and it's like, come on, guys, it picks up. But uh, th these these are, you know. Hey, it's good to see my buddy Network Bits here. Joe Voids here. Tullowit. Good to see every Andre. Hope everybody's doing well. No, yeah, I almost okay. to put it on live chat. There we go. Elaine, good to see you. Blue Lantern. Yeah, we got, this is old home week here today. Will Shaw, of course. T.D. Washington, Trey Dilley. Good Lord. All right, so before okay. we get started, one thing I am curious about is what version of Active Directory are we going to be demoing in today? Uh, well, I actually downloaded the latest trial version, which is Server 2022. And the desktop experience, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's got to have the got to have the GUI if you ask me yeah. yes I, I mean understand. I appreciate for those that don't know you know server used to only come point and click interface UI a GUI and uh finally I guess after years of competing against Linux and other comparable servers that had just command line versions they released a server of just command line through uh, primarily PowerShell so now if you're actually installing Windows Server you need to select whether you want the CLI version or the GUI version, which they call the GUI version, the desktop experience. So it's quite interesting. I cut my teeth on a Windows GUI a long time ago. And honestly, I don't know how much I could do from a command line in terms of configuration. DC promo, does that still work? Yeah, DC promo works. Uh, you know, your GP update and all that good stuff. But other than that, yeah. Uh, PowerShell is actually incredibly intuitive. I know that's a discussion for another time, but I really like the new PowerShell and as far as managing uh, the enterprise level services that, that Windows offers. Very cool. So Zam has got, he's running uh, 2012 R2s and 2019 servers. I see that. Jose Braves, good there. Lord. Is everybody like owe me money or something? Is that why everybody's showing up? <laughs> They're all showing up to get paid. Yeah, yeah, I owe them money. That's probably the better way to say that. What one. um what are your plans for the holidays? You got any big plans for Christmas and New Year? No, no. See, Christmas and, and Thanksgiving are the two days out of the year where my phone doesn't really ring. And uh Makes I uh, I I don't want to get too grinchy here, but the idea of sitting around in my pajamas playing World of Warcraft while the phone doesn't ring is 
delicious sounding to me. Are you playing the new expansion or are you back on the classic versions? I'm back. I've been back on the classic for two years. I don't see myself going back to retail. Yeah, I haven't played since uh, the Panda one. I can't remember the name of that. Pendragon. I'm kidding. Uh, I don't remember. Miss the Pandaria. So I haven't played since the first month of that. And uh, I always, you know, it's just one of those games that always feels familiar to me to look at and and to to get back into because, you know, I've played it since it it, uh, launched. But I never got back into the classic stuff, and I'm not interested in any of the last five expansions or how many it's been. So it's it's a safe addiction for me to stay away from, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, you know, I can give it up anytime. What do you mean? (laughs) All right, so I think we got a pretty good crowd. Hey, folks. It's uh, the Mike Myers Ask Mike Anything live stream with my good friend and fellow A-plus talent. Steve Nicholson is joining us today. Um, Steve, we'd have, the people always worry about Active Directory. Mm. Uh, in particular, that it comes in on the A-plus can be a challenge for folks uh, because the whole idea behind the A-plus certification is you have one system that you're connecting to the internet, that you're connecting to a LAN, that you're you know doing stuff with, but you're always looking at it from the end user standpoint. So to use Active Directory, I found that to be a challenge a lot. Yeah. Uh, maybe not so bad in Network Plus, but certainly a challenge in A+. Mm-hmm. So uh, what I thought we could do today is just have a uh, I'm going to make sure this goes with what your plan is, since we planned this so carefully together, um, is just kind of do a quick overview discussion of Active Directory. Sure. And then follow that up with uh, interesting labs and some configuration stuff. Sounds good. You want to lead? You want me to lead? How do you want to do it, my friend? No, take it away, Jeeves. So here, <laughs> how, how about this for a great lead in? So, Steve... What is Active Directory? And don't say a flower dying in the desert, okay? Star Trek reference, never mind. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I should know that, but I don't. Well, you should. (laughs) Well, Mike, as you know, I mean, you've been in the industry now for, what, 40 years? Something like that? Long day, long time! Mark and my day! We had to configure everything. Yeah. Well, back in the the day, I should say, uh, on... Uh, when a company wanted to configure a particular user or uh, access to a printer or something like that, they had to actually do it on the specific systems that that user uh, needed to access or that printer was directly tied to. Uh, the genius is at Microsoft. And, you know, obviously you can imagine as your company grows, the problem for managing that efficiently also grows because that's more systems that you have to get one-on-one times with, uh, one-on-one hands-on with, and more that you have to maintain and manage and ensure that the right users are, are in the right groups and all that other stuff. So the geniuses at Microsoft ended up coming out with a centralized database built into their server system uh, that just stores and tracks all that. And what it does is it actually enables users to log directly into what's called a domain controller or the Active Directory side of, of their system, a server, and authenticate that way and actually receive permission on whatever local system they are for the specific you know, resources or printers or shares or whatever it may be that they uh, are deemed, uh, that, that they are allowed to have access to. So it really, it really helped us uh, with the manageability of systems and especially, like I said, in, in a wide enterprise system. I remember, I remember, I remember so far back that things like Norton Ghost were a godsend to us, the ability to image quicker because you still had to go to every single machine way before AD and, and image every single one and put all those permissions on and, and soft, software like Norton Ghost, excuse me, really helped stream like that. But then when Active Directory came out, I mean, it was a game yeah, changer. I mean, before Active Directory, or you had, if you had a file server, you had to log into that file server. If you had another file server, you had to log into that file server. If that, if you've got a print server, then you have to log into the print server. There's always this logging in and, uh, Windows was one of the first people to come up with the idea of single sign-on, which basically goes, look, instead of having personal accounts on all these different server things, we're going to set up this super server called an, uh, well, back in the old days, even before Active Directory in the early versions of Windows, really that was just a common username and password pile. 
Yep. And uh, in fact, they use the word domain without even thinking of the word DNS. And then, uh, so today, uh, Windows really is the place for single sign-on. If you've got an enterprise where you need to log into a bunch of different systems and have your what you can do all preset, uh, Microsoft Windows, I, I know big Linux data farms that still have a Windows server running in there just for authentication. Yeah. Because it, it works great. Uh, yeah, and and there, is, there is no other single sign-on tool as robust and as well-known as Microsoft's Active Directory. So, Steve, yep. what do I need to set up an Active Directory? Well, yeah, I mean, probably the simplest way. And keep in mind, these are all things on the CompTIA objective list as well. You're expected to get hands-on with Windows Server. While it may be a shallow you know, step into the water that we do with Windows Server during the CompTIA A plus examination, it is still required that you have that experience. So the, I guess, kind of the breadth of questions that you may experience kind of uh, it, it widely varies, but you want to make sure that you get obviously some way to interact with Windows Server. My personal preference is a virtual machine. I know plenty of people that like keeping multiple either uh, additional physical systems, you know, nearby that they can just, you know, load a new system on or anything like that. I just, I like to virtualize a lot of it and I like to virtualize a lot of it simply because I'm a very big believer in repurposing old systems. And so what I do is every couple of years as I renew my gaming PC or my primary workstation, I put the old one to task with something else. And in this case, or the last couple of iterations anyways, have been a virtual machine server. And that's a little beyond the scope of what we're gonna get into today, but the, I just want you to be aware of that possibility. You can kind of upcycle that equipment you have and turn it into useful lab equipment for you to perform your studies on. So my particular favorite way is, let me go ahead and share my screen here. My, and let me know when that clicks on because I have no way of telling. It looks like your screen is being shared. Oh, what are we right. looking at here, Steve? So what we're looking at here is actually VMware Workstation. Now, you're going to need, in order to deal with a virtual machine, you're going to need a virtual machine manager, right? Uh, which one you decide to use is totally up to you, what your preference is. I know a lot of people like Oracle VirtualBox, and it's fantastic for localized virtual machines. I know uh, some, well, I should say a few people like Hyper-V. I'm sure they're... They're out there somewhere, few and far between, um, which is included with Microsoft Windows, and you can install that right through Add Remove uh, features. Uh, I personally prefer VMware Workstation for the ability to set up what's called a bare metal server on that repurposed old gaming PC I told you about, and then I can connect to it remotely like I am here. You'll notice that this is VMware Workstation Pro, and I'm actually, I can manage the entire system I can connect to other remote servers or install ones locally on my machine here, but I'm actually connecting to my remote server on my network, and I've got a pre-built uh, Windows Server 2022 64-bit already installed. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and open that up. I've got it powered on, and again, I did the install ahead of time. It helps uh, kind of save time here. And I'm actually going to sign in with what is the domain admin account for my domain. My particular domain I set up is stevisit.local. And you'll notice it popped up at the bottom here before we get into the server panel that my license is valid for another 176 days. So Dave is gonna post in chat here the link to get the Windows Server VM link and it's 180 day eval and you can keep reinstalling it. So uh, it provides you plenty of access to get hands on with your server. And when you first load up uh, Windows Server here, you're going to have a bunch of these little role panels and stuff. Actually, the first, the only one that's initially installed, I take that back, is file and storage services. But in order for me to add Active Directory, I had to also add the DNS module here, and they're all located here. You so can hang on, also... Steve, Steve, hang on a minute. Let's make sure we got a picture here of all the parts people need. So you're using VMware Workstation Pro, which is- yep, I, you can also you, use the free version of Player 
or uh, Oracle VirtualBox or Hyper-V, you would just have to do a local installed uh, virtual machine versus a remote hosted one. Okay. So and the reason I do that, Mike, is simply to enable uh, more resources on my system, right? Because it's less that my hardware has to do while I'm streaming it to you guys. I want to make sure everybody understands. You guys do, I make sure we all understand that there are Windows server versions. This is not your Windows 10 or 11 right. Pro that you put on your desktop, right? Uh, right. This, th this software costs thousands and thousands of dollars, and they usually have to pay by the number of people who connect to it. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is just because you install Windows Server, that doesn't mean you've installed Active Directory. Windows Server has all kinds of features, and you have to install or what we call DC Promo, Darley, Dog Charlie Promo. It's an old command line we used to use uh, that takes a regular Windows Server and then turns it into a domain controller. So that means it has to have special Active Directory software running on it. And just as uh, he mentioned, you have to have a DNS server. If you're going to upgrade a system to an Active Directory machine, it has to have DNS on it as well. This is all built into the server. You just have to make sure it's all installed, as I'm sure you did, right? Yep, yep, we're all good here. And I was actually going to, I left these alerts up on purpose to, and these events to show that it, it's quite intuitive. I can come over here and see what the actual alert is. It's for a delayed start service, which is really not a big deal, the clipboard user service. But if I was troubleshooting something, if I was having issue with my server, uh, this is kind of a really drilled down event viewer that also allows some interactivity. So I can come in here and just test it and try restarting the service and see if it actually works, if it's a necessary one. As you can see, it does. There was no problems there. And then the event here was, I actually on purpose, uh, hard shut down the VM the last time. And so you'll notice Windows Server because, again, keep in mind, servers are meant to be continuously running, right? 24-7 nonstop. So a shutdown is a abnormal event for servers, and it actually gets logged as such. When you manually go to shut down the server, which you'll see here in a minute, it actually wants you to write the reason why and whether or not it's planned or unplanned. So this way, everything is logged there. But the cool part, like Mike mentioned about adding all these individual roles and things, is it gives you a whole host of new tools within uh, Windows administrative tools. Like you can see, I now have the entire AD administrative center. I have domains and trusts. I have my sites and services. And I have probably one of the most important ones, users and computers. Because remember, guys, as we talked about before, if I'm an organization, say I'm Total Seminars, right? Well, Total Seminars is going to have its own servers, its own workstations or PCs, its own laptops, its own cell phones, its own users, its own printers, all that stuff. And previously, we had to go through and configure all those manually. And now, I mean, it's pretty much point and click. I don't have any users here, but I could customize everything. For instance, uh, and by the way, these individual things, these users and PCs and servers and printers and all these things that are, make up an organization's domain are known as organizational units. And I know for sure that that's on the exam. But the great part about all this is it enables me so much more flexibility in managing users. Uh, I can come into this user and set specific user groups they are members of which allows them, you know, depending on what permissions are inherent in that user group, it also passes those permissions down to that user. And I can do other things like, you know, set certain login scripts. I'm pretty sure login scripts is still in uh, an active directory term on the A+, but you can do it right here for users at the, uh, at the uh, users and computers panel. And uh, yeah, so Active Directory is fantastic. I, I definitely suggest getting hands on with it. Not only will it help you answer the questions on the A plus exam uh, a lot easier, but it's also going to prepare you for those eventual future studies, right? Your network plus, your security plus. If you go on and do any of the MTA certs or anything like that, it all ties into your, you know, and you go out into the field, right? You're going to encounter Windows Server nonstop. Um, and generally more the GUI version than the CLI version, as Mike and I both like to admit. Trying to catch up on some questions real quick. Let's see here. Uh, can I install Active Directory to WinPro VM or do I need Windows Server? You need Windows Server. It is a feature and role only for servers. Um, and we can actually come back over here and take a look at some of the other ones. Um, yeah, do, and guys, do keep in mind, Steve showed you how you can get a, a free 180-day 
uh, test version of Windows Server. And uh, that's what we do. Uh, you don't want to buy Windows Server. Right. And Microsoft doesn't want you to buy Windows Server for these types of situations. That's what yep. these evaluation versions are for, is just for us to play. Granted, at the end of 180 days, you got to buy another or download another copy, but usually that's not how this works. So go for it. Yeah, yeah, no, Mike's absolutely right. So again, you can do a lot of this lab work that you need for your either official studies or sort of industry certification studies or whatever, you can get away with a lot of this for virtually low cost, uh, especially if you virtualize a lot of it. But if we look at some of the roles and features here in AD, I'm just going to select, you can see that not only can we, you know, add all this other stuff, lightweight to LDAP, right? If we wanted LDAP, uh, which is, I'm not sure, is LDAP still in the exam, Mike? I don't remember having a question about LDAP. If it isn't, it should be. I mean, it's one of the old X.509 protocol derivatives. Yeah, uh, yeah I can't remember if I I don't remember if that's actually an objective. I don't think it is on A-plus anymore. What a shame. It could uh, be in the we glossary, add, though. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is in the term glossary. But we could add LDAP or DHCP server. So if we wanted our domain controller here to also issue IPs to anything that joins our network or authenticates through it, we can do that as well. And uh, we can do, yeah, here again, here's Hyper-V. So we can install Hyper-V on the server, which I'm give, I'm guessing, I've never used Hyper-V on the server version. I'm guessing it allows us to also do remote VMs, kind of like Workstation. No, Pro no, does. Steve, uh, Hyper-V is Microsoft's hypervisor. You're already running VMware, so you don't want to, you don't want to run Hyper-V. Oh, yeah. I I'm not saying running them at the same time. I'm, I'm not adding it. I'm just saying that this is an alternative. I'm guessing if you're enabled to, if you're, uh, if you're allowed to install it as a role on server, I'm guessing this would offer the same features as Workstation Pro is what I'm saying, in that you can do remote management of VMs, right? Uh, all kinds of stuff. I, they, the only thing is I'd recommend being real careful. Again, you've already got your virtual machine. You've got VMware, yeah, not, right? Yeah, I but wasn't going to install it on there. I'm just describing the roles. The other challenge to Hyper-V is that it's a type one hypervisor. So That is true. When you install it, it's literally going to write to the bare metal and yep. your copy of Windows that you're staring at right now is becomes virtualized, which is kind of cool, but it's kind of hard to get back from. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. Uh, but that is an option. And then again, you know, if you need to do RDP services to allow remote access to, to manage a server or, uh, you know, IIS, hey, you want to make it a web server, I wouldn't recommend doing an AD and a web server all at once because you... I'm not even sure if that role will allow it because you never want your forward facing entity to also be the uh, single sign on. But uh, you have a bunch of different roles and features you can add to Windows Server here and kind of really get hands on with it. I know, Mike, in a lot of the training and a lot of your home videos, you have your total home set up. Are you still dealing with that? Do you still you know, enjoy getting hands on with that on a daily basis? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We use that all the time. Yeah, I figured. And it does, again, it greatly increases the efficacy of, uh, of managing your, your home network. And as you add devices on it or users or, you know, features or interoperability, that becomes essential. And I cut Sweet. my teeth on administering Windows networks. So yeah. it's hard for me to want to go away from something that I can make dance the way I want it to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that is essentially the, uh, here it is asking me to confirm, but that is essentially Windows Server and how to get hands on with it. There aren't too many objectives on the A-plus anymore for Windows Server, but there are enough that you need to be concerned with it, as well as, again, understanding Windows Server and Active Directory and all that will help you understand the greater Microsoft Windows ecosystem in, in total, and you know it's going to make you a better tech all around, plus add more little uh, skills to your resume as well, which is always yeah, important. The, the, the only thing I would add to that, Steve, is when you're talking about a plus wants you to know about features of Active Directory. So one of the things I'd recommend is that A, don't confuse Windows Server with an Active Directory system. Any all Active Directory controllers are Windows systems, but not all Windows, let me say it even better. All Active Directory controllers are Windows Server, but not all Windows servers are Active Directory controllers. In a larger network, it's not uncommon to have 30, 40, 50 servers, yep. either physical or uh, in the cloud. And of those in most organizations, two of them are Active Directory controllers. 
the idea is that if one goes down, the other one automatically takes over for it. So yep. just something to keep in mind. Yeah, great point. Yeah, the m most large organizations have dozens and dozens of servers all efficiently either handling one specific role or as backups in case the primary role, the primary role uh, service provider dies out. So, And then the other thing I'd make sure that kids remember for A+, plus is that when you log into an Active Directory, you're logging in with an Active Directory account. Yep. That account is stored on the Active Directory controller, no place else. So that means in essence, you have two logins. Before you had Active Directory, you were probably just using a local login. And that's going to give up one desktop. But the moment you join a domain uh, and you you have an Active Directory controller to log into, you're logging into the domain, not your individual system. You actually get a different desktop and stuff, which can be a little frustrating for some folks. Yeah. But that's yeah. the but design. You, yeah. But then you also get the flexibility of being able to, you know, have those roaming profiles spin up anywhere you are within the organization by having this single sign-on. So... It's a double-edged sword as usual. But yeah, this is what Mike was talking about, logging in instead of locally onto the actual domain itself. All right, how are we looking on questions? Uh, you, we got one so far, which we've answered. Let me take another peek. And I still use the 180-day test server on Azure. Yeah, actually you can. That's a great question, Blue Lantern. I wasn't going to touch on that too much, but if you do have an Azure account, Microsoft makes it incredibly easy. In fact, I think it's like a two or three click process to actually install uh, Windows Server on an Azure VM for free to play with. So uh, it should be actually on that same link that I believe Dave shared earlier. Let me double check here. I believe, uh, yeah, so the very first, if you click on that link that Dave shared earlier for the Windows Server trial, the very first one is starting it on Azure and it, it automatically spins it up for you, asks you what roles and everything. So it, it's actually uh, very seamless. Oh, here we go. Hey, Mike, how do you use PFSense on virtual environment, i.e. Workstation Pro? Does it have to be always on for virtual PFSense to work? Uh, yes, it has to be on. <laughs> if you turn it off, it's not going to work. Just as if you turned off a physical router, it's yep. not going to work. Yeah, it needs to be running. Uh, and again, these are things I've never actually tried to do PF Sense in its own VM. I never have either. I actually bought an APC for it. Uh, so I actually have it running on its own separate machine meant just for it. A uh, quick scan looks like it can easily be done, but I've never done it. So they're showing how to run it on uh, ESXi, which is the VMware type Fair one metal. hypervisor, the basic one. So yep. it looks like there are steps. Deploy PF Sense into VMware step by step. I don't know how to do it, but based on the quick, let me Google it for you. It looks like it's very doable. I wouldn't know why you would want to do that. You'd probably want to offload that to its own endpoint, right? To your own Pi or APC or something. I'm not sure why you would run it, want to run it through a, a PC. It seems like an extraordinary waste of resources. Well, if you can open security. up a if you can open up a virtual box to do it, you know, just from a research standpoint, you know, create oh, your yeah. own little isolated network. I mean, it would be a good playground that you had control of everything as opposed to running it like even within my network. You know, I probably have including my IOT, I probably have 15 to 20 servers and I, I get, I get a lot of noise on my network and I need yeah. to clean up and I never get around to it. So my guess would be to create a nice virtualized lab type session. That's that I'm going to stick with that. Interesting. I never thought about doing that. Hey, Mike and Steve, I just signed up for a Udemy course to help me pass the CompTIA A plus congrats, John. Is it possible to get you in the industry with just certs and no college degree? So certs and experience, yes, just certs by themselves. I'm not, I can't really say. Um, I, I don't think, I know there's companies that hire just for having that cert. So you can get in the industry, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, but you're to put your best foot forward, you obviously want to get in with a little bit of experience, which you can gain while you're studying for the cert, I suppose, right? It's always good to have the home lab and, and work and study at the same time, right, Mike? There's always spots. There's always entry level jobs. Yeah. You can get an A plus right now and get work. There you're you going to have to bust your rear end to find them. As I tell everybody, if you're not doing 
200 resumes, you're not doing enough. But uh, you, you can get jobs with just certification. Remember, the idea behind the certification, it's, it's really for your next job, not your current job. Yep. And uh, so, you know, people pick up a couple of certs and they need to start looking for work immediately. You know, people get in this thing in their head, well, I need to get A plus, Net plus, Security plus, CYSA, CNN, you know, and then I'll look for a job. No, no, no. <laughs> start looking for a job immediately and you get your certifications for your next job. Go, Steve. Let's start doing some more Active Directory stuff, man. <laughs> oh, I see. You want to answer Zam's thing? Because that probably will take 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll do uh, close up with questions. He wants to implement or push a firewall rule to allow GP update force. So there's only two places to put a startup script. And a startup script can be anything. It can be Visual Basic. It can be PowerShell. It can be an MSI. It doesn't have to be a script. It can be anything you want. OK, as long as it's executable within a Windows environment. Uh, Steve, how hard would it be for us to go back to users and computers? On Not your, at all. And, uh, uh, the only thing is he asked specifically from a firewall standpoint. So I just wanted to make that clear. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. So I, I wasn't sure if that's. If that's what he actually wants and maybe it's just a. So I see a question from Zam. I got a question from Zam at 223 login scripts. What are some common login scripts used and their conceptual purpose, what it's trying to accomplish? Probably the biggest thing I see for startup scripts is usually some kind of welcome banner that pops up. Uh, if there are particular timeframes for a system, if there are uh, situations that make this particular system have to give noteworthy information. Do not attempt to log in locally, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. You can pop up message screens. That's, that's super common. Uh, I also see some types of different agents that are uh, run with a startup script. Uh, actually, that doesn't really need to happen. Most of the time, you can go into the registry itself and under, oh, God, H key local machine, current software set, Microsoft Windows run. And you can usually put individual executables there. So that would be some of the examples. Uh, but messaging is a big one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially if you ever work in any uh, federal or state agency, every terminal you go to log on, there's a pop up that comes up, you know, hey, you're being monitored. Everything's being monitored, including audio. Watch what you say. Watch, watch what you type. So, yep. Uh, I've got the AD users and computers up. I think I know which direction you want to go. That's it. Yep. Okay. So if you take a look right there, Zan, this is a great way to have a startup script for a particular uh, person or group. And uh, so these startup scripts and they will run every single time the system starts up. The other place to put these in is under, uh, how are you at RegEdit? I'm fine. I, I mistakenly started Magnifier up thinking this would save us time and now I'm locked up. So hold on, give me one sec. Okay. Anyway, you can go into RegEdit and there is a run once and run fields that, uh, I'm gonna see if I can get it on my end. There we go. Woo. locked up there we go there you go so go under uh h key local machine uh software uh microsoft uh windows scroll down down d d down down and here's where i gotta remember is it Try shell. I forget where it is. Nope. I can't believe I've got, I've forgotten this one off the top of my head. We're getting older by the minute, my friend. Oh, I just look it up every time I have to do this. <laughs> Microsoft Windows.
I'm looking on my end. Oh, come on. This is a super famous. Well, Mike's looking for that. I'm going to answer a few questions. Does anyone have any ideas on ways I can gain experience? Yeah. So, uh, Andre gave you some great advice there, John. Not only can you, you know, offer to fix computers, make sure you know what you're doing though, right? Not only can you fix computers for family, friends, neighbors, churches, and so on, but maybe check around your local area. If you live near a big city, they might have colleges that ha have uh, PC labs. A lot of colleges donate equipment to their local PC labs. You can get hands-on, uh, you know, just in case so you, if you mess something up, there's no worries. Uh, there's also maker spaces. There's a bunch of different ways to get hands-on. Okay, you ready? Here we go. H key yes. local machine, software, Microsoft, Windows. Did I, I had that all right, huh? Yeah, you were there. And under Windows, look under current version. There you go. And you scroll down, there should be a run and a run once. I see them. So uh, those are going to handle it individually, but usually what you want to do in this situation is you're going to use that same startup script, which will inject this into your uh, registry. Um, you can easily do this with PowerShell if you want. You can actually even do it if you have a pre-made uh, registry edit uh, file. You can uh, you could make a batch file to do it. It's it's pretty straightforward. I don't want to get into exactly how to make a script because that is not not it's outside of my lane. But uh, you can uh, do stuff in, in there. But the main thing you're going to be doing more than anything else is you're going to be doing it from the individual uh, from the users and computers within the server. And you could also, if you want, set up a uh, uh, a security control to uh, take care of that as well. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you, buddy. So th that would be under, uh, you could do this as a group policy on the server to yep. set up a script that's run every time. It's been a while since I've done that, but. Uh... So right. pick a here, you can pick a domain, Steve, from where you're at. Sure. And pick that one domain. And then uh, starter group policy objects. I'm pretty sure that you could just go ahead and start installing. Uh, uh, one. You can install GPOs there. I don't remember exactly how to do it. It's trivially enough to look up on Microsoft. Uh, but that would be the other place that would happen. And not only that, Mike, you have, I mean, being honest with you, everything changes with every iteration of their UI. So this is the latest and greatest server 2022. So some things have definitely moved. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, they, they've definitely uh, manipulated group policy once again, because that's what Microsoft likes to do. Yep. But uh, that's where you'd put it in. So, Zam, I hope that answers your question. Let's see. answer that one is there a way to practice my windows command line on linux without using a virtual machine no uh, if you want to practice windows command line you need windows yeah i don't think i, I guess you could emulator. come up with some kind of simulation or something i wouldn't know how to do that or maybe an online emulator somehow but i'm not sure if such one exists typically it's the other way around people have windows and want practice with linux online sure yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure there, Kylie. I apologize. Put it in a virtual machine. Oh, she says, uh, my computer's really old and uh, crappy. I'm worried I'll have problems with the VM. Well, you won't know until you try. The great thing is you can enable virtualization services if your hardware supports it. And you can, you know, install the VM. And if it does, you know, you can actually set what, allocate what 
physical resources are dedicated to the VM. So if you have four cores on your CPU, for instance, you can dedicate just one to that. If you have eight gigs of RAM, you can dedicate just two to it, uh, to the VM. So that way it doesn't automatically just spin up and scale up and, and use all your system resources. You can, you can manage that uh, pretty intuitively. So the trick here is how old is your computer? Yeah, that's what I was going to uh, say. But that assumes, you know, that you can actually do virtualization support in the first place. Well, you can like, I, I don't know VMware that well, but I know that with the virtual box, as long as you don't use version 6.1, it will still allow, it will still support uh, virtualization on CPUs that do not have the VTX or whatever it's called. Really? I didn't feature know Feature built into it. Uh, if you get uh, virtual box, 6.1 or greater, you will have to make sure you have a system that has it. But they've had it for a while. I mean, if you have a system that's more than five years old, there's a chance that maybe it doesn't have it, but uh, it's been around for a while, that feature. So just make sure you get a hypervisor that supports it. Again, with VirtualBox, if you've got such an old system it doesn't, use the 6.0 version. Otherwise, use 6.1 or better. The other problem you got to remember with an older machine is do you have enough RAM? Uh, 16 gig is a minimum yeah. in my opinion. And, uh, 32 would make me happier. And I, I, almost every system I build now has 64 gigs of Ram, if not 128. I agree. It, just and, depending on how thick my wallet is when I'm putting together a system. Yeah. And that actually triggered a little mental note. You bringing that up when I was installing this windows server 2022 environment, uh, the minimum required disk space is now up to 90 gigabytes. So uh, you can't, you have to have at least 90 gigabytes free to even install Windows Server 2022 these days. And that might limit the system that you're running it on as well. I agree. So in your particular setup you have here, Steve, where, where is this virtualized system running? What hardware is it running on? Uh, well, we can actually take a look straight from the, oh, let me actually. Let me go ahead and power this off and I can show you directly. My, I'm not still sharing, am I? I don't see you. All right, here we go. Let's try it again. Come on, Zoom. All right, hopefully you can see that now. I do. Okay. Uh, so the hardware that I'm actually using for this is not that great of hardware. It's probably eight, 10 years old, but it's an old uh, i5. You know, so it's quad core at 3.5 gig uh, base, 32 gigs of RAM. And I have a crucial 240 gig SSD, I believe, in there for my VMs. Um, the cool part is, let me log into my web interface over here. Bring this over here. Can you see the web interface for this? So, and again, this is a, re this is a machine that's in your house, yep. right? And right. what is it running for a hypervisor? It's not running, it's it's running ESXi. So yeah, bare, bare metal ex, ESXi, which is free from VMware. So basically for those that don't know, this is just a very small thin layer of software that, that this system boots into that allows it to uh, manage virtual machines. And that's all that it does. And so basically seeing... what you're looking at here, folks, is Steve has a dedicated virtual machine server. There's a yep. box in Steve's house that does nothing but shares out virtual machines. How many VMs do you have sitting on this server right now, Steve? Uh, right now, I just have three. My most recent, which is the one for this demo, um, you know, Windows Server 2022, Parrot OS, which is my daily driver in Linux, uh, and then the SIFT workstation because I was doing some digital forensics uh, tutoring with students. So, But I have uh, in my data store, which is... So with these, with ESXi, I can... I can have certain storage folders to offload all my ISOs to. And oh, yeah. then as I need them, install them or bring them back, you know, it's VMX and VMDK files and all that. So uh, in my data store, I probably have 15, 20 different VMs ready to just be pulled over, you know, takes about three minutes. So the, what, when you're setting up virtual machines to teach yourself anything, and for the record, guys, it doesn't just have to be Active Directory. You got three choices. Choice number one, you can use a type two hypervisor like VirtualBox, and you can install virtual machines on your local machine, that same machine that's running Windows. You can run VirtualBox and you can uh, 
connect to those as much as you have hard drive space. Number two, you can do what Steve's doing here. He's got a server in his house and he is installed ESXi. This is a type one hypervisor. There is no Windows or Linux here, folks. This is the operating system that runs it. And then what Steve's doing is using a, a tool called, uh, what is it, VMware Workstation Pro? Yes, Workstation Pro. And that knows how to, uh, it pretty much automatically knows how to connect to an ESXi server. The thing is, folks, uh, well, Workstation Pro is still about 100, 120 bucks, right? Yeah, the only the good part I will say about this is what you're seeing right now is the web interface. So I can actually, with the web interface, if it lets me actually go into the VMs here, for some reason it's lagging out. Um, I can actually go in and start up VMs from here if I wanted to. So I have my data store here and everything and run sure. them through the browser. So I don't need, if I have ESXi, I don't need the bare metal. I don't need the VMware Workstation Pro. I can actually just run it through the browser. As you're seeing right now, this is just through the browser. But accessing. Steve, it's it's my understanding that you can run a virtual machine, <clears throat> but you can't edit it. That you have to have Workstation Pro to create and edit virtual machines. Is that accurate? Uh, no, you can definitely create them with even the the base metal, uh, uh, the base VMware player, which is the free version. So you can definitely create them uh, in order to access to in order to connect to remote servers, like having the ability in the actual VMware software to connect to a re remote server here, you have to have the pro version. That's really the only limitation. The ESXi is actually serving up this straight from the web interface here. That's all this is. Okay. So if, if you were to start up another operating system, would it start up within a, with, within a browser window? Would I have a screen in a browser window? Yeah, you just have another tab like this one does. All right. Yeah. It didn't used to be that way. Part of the reason I am such a, a virtual box fanatic is that you get everything pretty much for free. Now, granted, you know, uh, VMware is the performance king of virtualization. Uh, but uh, it uh, it does get a couple of uh, what I've always thought were a couple of price gotchas in there. Anyway, so the third thing you can do here, and this is something I really want to get into more, Steve, is using free cloud accounts mm. to configure up a base network in the cloud that you can just play with. Yeah. And uh, one of these days, we got to sit down, you and I, and really go through the process of how we would set that up. Not only that, but how would we set it up in different environments? For example, yeah. do it on AWS versus doing it on uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure and right. to see the benefits and costs of all that type of thing. So uh, I've seen other people try to do this, but I haven't found anybody yet who goes, uh, all right, here's the 20 steps you need to do in this order to make this happen. So, well, there's little benefits. Like for example, the way you've got your setup, Steve, that ESXi server is on a 192, 168, what? One? Yep. You're, the machine you're working on right now is a part of that same network, 192, 168, one, correct? Correct. So for me, another part of the temptation, and I know you can do this in VMware, and I certainly know you can do it in VirtualBox, is you create your own little virtualized network that all the VMs are not bridged to your network card. They have their own little 10.11.12 WAC24 network, say, mm -hmm. and you're isolated. So uh, other Windows machines tend to act very differently when there's an Active Directory controller on the LAN, yeah. whether they're even connected true. to it or not. That's true. So, That's true. That's why uh, they have all those options. In the yeah. feature install, like DHCP options and all. What is the famous one, 67 or 68? I, I can't remember that. Yeah, one so, that. Uh, well, what that boils down to then is uh, I think you and I could come up with a nice cloud lab. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, then be able to set that up. See, the problem we have here, Zam, is uh, it's easy to explain to you how to run the script, but we can't really run a script because it could wreak havoc on poor Steve's network. <laughs> as uh, scripts get uh, disseminated to all kinds of stuff that he doesn't want them to get disseminated to. Speaking of, believe me, I... it will try. Your printer will try to run a MSI script. 
Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It won't be successful, but it'll try by golly. Yep. And it'll error out doing so. Yeah. Um, speaking of, and, and kind of, this is off topic for Active Directory, but it, it, you know, we're constantly at Total Seminars expanding the scope of what we offer for the students. And I want to kind of get some help from the users that are here today. Let me go ahead and share my screen one final time. Uh, on my website, I've actually set up uh, the infamous OS Ticket Help Desk Portal. And so, you know, one of the, the best area, uh, entries into IT, I, I see, or at least that produces very skilled technicians being, uh, if they can take the work, is a help desk. But a lot of times people get nervous because all these help desk systems are a little bit different, the way you manage them, the way you answer tickets, the way you create tickets, all that stuff. So on my server here, it's just, it's very simple, stevezit.com forward slash help desk. I encourage all of you watching to get involved and go in there and click open a new ticket. There's a demo user here. Uh, all your ticket service tickets that you submit, um, you know, try to make them realistic, like problems you've run into, because this will end up being a great resource for us uh, down the road for students who, you know, first getting their hands on with help desk. So if you guys wouldn't mind, the general idea with this is to get it, you know, chock full of a bunch of different uh, help desk tickets and issues and solutions to those issues, and then eventually port this over uh, to the Total Seminars platform with uh, Mike Smyers' approval. So if everybody wants to give that a shot for me, just so I can kind of work through some of the kinks over the next few months, that would be great. Yeah, seriously, folks. Slash help desk. So is that the only user account you have demo with demo OD1 is the password? Yeah, demo uh, zero 01, yeah. yeah. That, is, that is an agent uh, one, so we can have multiple logins. It's just for submitting support tickets. I haven't, uh, I have admin accounts for all of us. Cool. So that is there and available if anybody wants to get hands on more with Help Desk or help me improve uh, this for released in the future, please do so. We got a bunch of questions coming in. Awesome. All right. We got nine uh, minutes. In fact, we, we may have to use the rest of the hour just on this. Trey Dilla. Hey, Mike, I am interviewing for a tier one sport role with my county on Tuesday. Any interview tips? Yeah. Number one, be five minutes early. Number two, know what this business is. Be ready to ask them questions about how the business works, how IT departments work, you know, uh, what kind of security do they use? Are you given a set of keys? You get to go everywhere. If you're on a help desk, uh, I'd ask about hours. Are you, you going to be running the uh, midnight to late in the morning shift? That happens. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, Clean up a little bit. Wear a nice shirt that doesn't have stains in the front. I know it's embarrassing, but we have to tell you nerds this every time because otherwise you'll forget. Maintain yeah. eye contact. Shake hands. Show enthusiasm. Show integrity. Don't worry about the technical stuff. Either you know it or you don't. At this point, especially on a help desk, somebody who shows a lot of integrity and enthusiasm is going to get a job from me faster than somebody with good tech skills who does not show yeah. that. So that would be the big things I'd recommend to you there, Trey Dilla. I agree. Uh, we got be... Oh, can I, can I add to that real quick? Go. One thing I always like to add to every interview that I, and, and keep in mind, an interview is not, you know, it's also the company selling themselves to you, right? So you, you, it's, you know, I know you might be desperate for a job and having paying work is great and all that, but to make sure it's the ideal fit, don't be afraid to ask questions. And one of the ones that I always love to ask <laughs> Uh, in an interview is when you hire me today or when you offer me the position today, how will you know a year from now or five years from now that I was the ideal candidate? And what this does is it kind of puts in the higher, it, it makes them think, okay, I've just put Mike in that role, right? And I'm going through all the responsibilities and job duties that that role entails, and I'm already visualizing him doing it. So it kind of, and he's concerned about, hey, what are his performance metrics down the road, right? What exactly are we going to measure his efficacy on? This is a great candidate. Hire him right away. So like, you know, kind of maybe not necessarily that question, but as it pertains to your county, you know, figure out some modality of that question. And it, I'd also say, you know, county services are big on social projects, the welfare of their constituents and citizens. So figure out exactly, you know, what is lacking in your in your county or your community and maybe go in with a couple suggestions, you know, if they if they ask uh, on how to improve it or some new programs to enact or maybe things that, you know, you're just generally excited about and you want to bring to their attention. I think that, like Mike says, that kind of enthusiasm really shines through. 
I agree with everything you said there. All right, we got a couple more questions. Bryson Johnson. Hey, Mike and Steve. I'm in high school getting my A+. I'm also enrolled in my community college. Is there a way I can get some experience? Yes. Start telling people you'll work on their computers. Yeah. It's not that hard. Uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes. I guarantee it. And make sure people know. So come in cheap. Come in yep. at $15 an hour for starters. And with the KV, you know, I'm still pretty new at this. I promise I won't break anything. I won't make anything worse, but I can't guarantee I'll fix anything every time. And uh, just get in there and start practicing. You're, it's a three foot rule. If there's somebody within three feet, have them go to get some cheap cards done and just say computer repair with your phone number on it and get out there and start trying to fix stuff. Uh, yeah. All kinds of volunteer groups. I know you say you live in a small town, but I guarantee there are churches there. I guarantee there are schools there. I guarantee that there are uh, fraternal organizations. I guarantee there's all kinds of people knock on the door and ask. The worst thing they're going to do is say no. Okay. Yep. So just get out there and pound on the door. You will be shocked how much uh, business you will get in a very, very short amount of time. And uh, just go for it. And always remember, we've got a Discord channel. If you're ever in the middle of something and you're stuck, be sure to join uh, our Discord channel here. Uh, and uh, we would uh, love to have you there. It's a great place when you're stuck and you need some quick help. So that absolutely. would be some of the first things I'd recommend. Yeah, absolutely. I'd also just, the only thing I'd add to that is keep an eye on Steam sales. Uh, get that PC building simulator. You know, if you want something that's going to walk you through uh, a great hands-on with terminology and what the actual part or component or adapter or wire or cable, whatever it looks like, that PC building simulator is, is very solid at that. And you, it doesn't matter that you live in a small country town or anything like that, because you'll be doing it right there on your, your own, own PC. So, and it's fun yes. to learn that way. Somebody's got to take that PC building simulator and take it to the, you know, Soho network simulator, where you actually drop it in your own routers and switches configuring your own WAPs, getting your uh, network ID squared away, getting your VLANs and VPNs squared yep. up. Man, there you go, Steve. You want to make a million dollars? Right there, brother. Let's do All it. Right, I'm ready. Make I'm up ready. a simulator and have it work with the PC building simulator. How crazy would that be, huh? That would be cool. More questions. Uh, 240, Gabriel Taylor. Is there a list that gives a rough overview of what you should know for A+. Yes, it's called the CompTIA Objectives. Uh, the objectives are, there's two sets of objectives. There's the 220-1101 objectives and 220-1102 objectives. If you get any of our total seminars products, we list those objectives either at the back of a book or as an add-on to video courses. So they're there. You can also pick up these objectives. They're public information. Go to comptia.org, C-O-M-P-T-I-A.org. And, uh, they may, they may make, ask for your email address, but you can download the two PDFs for the A plus, uh, and, and that's how you know. Another great way is take take a look at my A plus books right at the very front, man. We do a pretty good yes. job of listing not only those objectives, but which chapters we cover them in. And we do the same thing with the videos too, right, Steve? Yeah, it's, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, Don, I knew this was a Don question. Hi, Mike and Steve. How does cPanel integrate with Windows Server and on what interactions do they have? Is he talking never, control panel within Windows or is he talking about the, the web management utility cPanel? I'm sure he's talking about the web. Don asked okay. more intense questions. So oh, sorry. I'm sure he's I talking just want to make sure I'm on the same track. Uh, so usually cPanel is installed with servers. Linux uh, servers I've yeah. never seen it installed with a Windows server. Uh, if you're running cPanel, the server itself tends to be invisible. Uh, it's well, not probably, only that, but if you're running Windows Server to serve up web pages, you're using IIS and all that stuff's built into the GUI. You don't really need cPanel. But I, I'm not going to say cPanel does not work with Windows. Yeah, I don't know either for sure. <laughs> if you're running cPanel, you tend not to look at any of that. Right. Uh, you, you're obfuscating the operating system from the cPanel functions. So I guess the right answer is, is I don't know, but I'll bet it does. Zam. It's probably a plugin or an app for everything these days. Yep. Zam, can you compare contrast the benefits and differences of Azure versus a non-cloud 
Active Directory on a cloud versus doing it the one of two ways we described, either local bare metal or and not even a virtual machine in that case. Well, yeah, it would be local in a virtual machine versus uh, having your own virtual machine in a physical box, but still locally. Really what you're talking about is what makes cloud better than not cloud. Um, number one, the big thing is, is if done right, I'm pretty sure you can do it for free or for dirt cheap. Um, number two, you'll be able to set up virtualized clients within its own isolated network. And by doing that, you're not putting an Active Directory server on your main network and potentially throwing LDAP and L2 junk all over the place. Uh, if you make a mistake, it's easy enough to delete a VM or you start with like, for example, build your first VM, which is gonna be a Windows server, but it's not Active Directory. It doesn't have any roles. You leave that there. And then that way, when you're playing with this, you make a copy of that. Then you promote it to Active Directory. Then you realize you screwed up somehow. You delete it and you start over again. So that would be a big advantage that I would see doing this in the cloud as well. Uh, Azure does a nice job virtualizing switches and routers. And it can make it pretty and graphical, which I don't see in any other uh, virtualization tool. Uh, so those are some of the, the benefits, the downside, especially when you're first learning, a lot of times it's nice to physically have a real switch and have three or four computers plug that switch. So you're, you don't have the extra thought process of what the cloud means. You see where I'm coming from? It's just, you've got basic hardware, which can create a little bit of simplicity in your brain as you're learning. But then again, doing it in the cloud is potentially, if not free, dirt cheap. And yeah. that can be a very, very attractive option. All right. So one more, and this is a question for you. This is from Don. Uh, Steve, so I'm guessing the IP address on the web interface on ESXi is the one you set up on initial ESXi installation? Uh, yeah. So uh, as far as that, it's not very fancy. That's just grabbing an IP from my router. So it's whatever, I, I have certain ranges set for certain things. Now, local trusted systems all stay within the 10 dot, uh, the, the 1.10 to 1.30 range. So anything you see within there is kind of segmented a little bit out. And then as my trust deteriorates with a certain mechanism on my network, they get you know segmented out into different VLANs. So um, yeah, for it just happens to be the IP that the router assigned. There was no special config for me uh, required for that. Yeah, and when you're setting up any hypervisor like this, it's going to have setting up IP addresses and just like any other thing, it's still going to need a default gateway and all that goo. The uh, nice thing you get when you're doing something like this is if you want to, is you can set up two or three different network IDs yep. and, and can jump back and forth between them if you want. Uh, you can put virtualized routers in between these little things. You can make a fairly interesting, complex WAN, not just a LAN, but a WAN if, if you want to. I wouldn't do that at first if you're just learning Active Directory. You know, set up Active Directory server and then maybe two Windows 10 clients in that same little network just so you can practice logging them into the domain. But uh, if price is an issue, looking at cloud-based solutions is definitely a way to go. Yeah, and especially if like if you're a college student or have access to anybody with an edu email if you have access to an dot edu email address uh, that unlocks a world of free software or you know extended trials or additional features and a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today thank you so we got a <clears throat> gabriel taylor it just hit me again this is mike myers of the mike myers pc books yes <laughs> the one and only the myth the man the legend and then, uh, by the way, I went, go ahead, bud. I was just going to say, I went to register alphageek.com for you. I was going to give it to you as a Christmas gift, but somebody already has it and wants like 68,000 for it. And I just, I couldn't find the change in my couch. <laughs> uh, Gabriel Taylor, should I try to get a used server rack to make my own network at home? Not at first. Just stack switches and routers on the floor at first while you're practicing, mainly because you're going to be constantly plugging and unplugging stuff. Yep. So you might as well have it physically close. 
I'd recommend a nice table like the one I have here. Uh, it, it's I, I'm too old to be bending over and plugging things into the floor that much. So to have something, a workbench like this, I got this from Ikea for like 15 bucks. Uh, and I find that extremely convenient. I keep dedicated power and such. And this is where I do most of my work. Um, what else? It was, all right. So that's the big stuff. Okay. Steve, it's way after three. Sorry about that, man, but we're having so much fun chatting. It's after four of my track. time, Mike, so you're way off course now. I'm just double checking. Dave's got his little notations coming in. Folks, yep. I guess that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, I'll make a point on Monday to do follow-up questions uh, with Steve. And uh, somehow, if I can make enough time to get my uh, Windows virtual machine running on here again, I managed to turn it off with aplomb. Uh, I'll be ready with follow-up questions. But I think we got everybody covered. Uh, Elaine Batzer is always welcome to come on here. I'm so frustrated. The one time I finally got Elaine to come down to Houston, which was late this summer, and everything blew up for me on a personal basis. But uh, Dave did a good job. I always like to have, I always love to have Elaine on there. Any instructor with a great program like Ms. Batzer's is always very much appreciated. All right, guys. Uh, Elaine, what would I talk about? You talk about how amazing Mike Myers is and his new protege. Steve, who's coming on board five years from now they're going to be like who was mike myers oh i don't know about that I, I think you greatly underestimate the impact you've had on it as a whole my friend oh yeah if it wasn't for you i wouldn't be sitting here and that's not i have no reason to kiss your butt that's the truth go on <laughs> go on all right guys uh ollie your questions went unanswered hang on can't believe I was all these questions. Question. I must have scroll. Ollie, I'm sorry I missed it, mon frere, but that's the nice part. We're always here, man. We're always going to come back. Uh, hopefully, you'll be seeing more and more in Steve, especially on. Uh... So, Steve, just so you know, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to knock the. Uh, Ask Mike anything down to once a week. Okay. And uh, then we'll have like a Wednesday, but it's going to be topical where it doesn't really even have to be a live stream, to be honest with you, uh, where we're just going to be hitting certain topics. And some of them are going to be A plus topics. I would love to do, there, there'd be two conversations I'd love to have with you. And both of them are beyond A plus, but they're so cool. One of them would be, CPU caching, L1, okay. L2, L3, and how set association and tag addressing is really changing that world. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's crazy. Uh, it, it, it would take us a while to, to get into detail on that. And it's certainly not on the exam, but man, is it CIC, you know? Yes. And then cool. the other one I would like to talk about, and it's never been talked about before in a CompTIA type course, it's not on the exam, but it's another one of these that I think everybody wants to hear about. We need to have a discussion on RAM timings and what that really means. So we can either do it from a overclocker standpoint, or we can do it from a conceptual standpoint, you know, just do, you know, RAS pre-charge, RAS to, dang, C CAS prefetch, RAS pre-charge, RAS to CAS, and what's the fourth one? Oh, uh, writing. I can never remember the steps in RAM timing. So if I'm rusty, I know you're rusty, Steve. Definitely. But uh, it, it would be fascinating, in particular with that new system I built uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. It's got a very overclockable motherboard, and there's RAM timing features in there that I think, especially in the world of late-gen DDRs where latencies are going through the roof, I think that people would be fascinated uh, yeah. by by something like that as well as any topic you might want to cover i'm uh uh but uh so keep some in mind you know i will i will definitely and, uh, uh, remind us again what type of gpu did you get something integrated right like an apu that's what you got nothing really good or fancy i don't think right oh oh my mistake 
That'll do. Yeah. Smells good, doesn't it? That'll do, pig. That'll, <laughs> That'll do. do, pig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a little proud of that. You but, know, you have uh, to actually so plug folks, that in, you... though, for it to work, right? I'm sorry? You know, you have to actually plug that in for it to work, though, right? You're going to need a PCI X16 I can spin the fans with my fingers. Oh, okay, okay. Now, we've actually tested. It's running great. But, Good. folks, this is an opportunity for you, especially any technical topics that you want to really start drilling into. Uh, I would anticipate by the end of the year at the at the latest that we'll be switching over. We'll always have a AMA. I know you guys need that when you're asking questions. But we're going to be looking towards more topics. If there are particular topics that you want covered, this is your opportunity to, to talk about them. Do keep in mind that we've already covered, we've been at this for two years now, guys. So we have a big backlog of topics, but uh, we're probably going to start cleaning out the episodes where I was just asking questions. We've probably got 50 or 60 topics already done. And uh, not to get too Professor Messer here, but uh, you know they'll probably sit there for free forever, but we're going to start building on that dramatically. And uh, so give me topics. And uh, absolutely, it's the way to go. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm easy to get a hold of. See how easy that was? There we go. Just, uh, whoop, wrong one. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. Just send me an email to michaelm at totalsem.com, and I would love to address them, okay? All right, so listen, I've got to go. Steve, always fun to have you, Mon Frere. Pleasure, my bud. Let's do this again soon. I know we're going to have follow up AD questions uh, and we'll be glad to answer them for you. But until then, this is your uncle Mikey saying bye-bye. Steve, give him a big dating game wave there. You ready? No, 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 no. Just like that. <laughs> bye kids. Y'all be good. Take care, everybody. Have a happy Christmas. And here's where Dave jumps in and closes the meeting. He could have fallen asleep. Let's do another hour. Sure.